Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our webinar this morning on innovative ideas to build youth voice in your program. Um, as a reminder, these webinars are sponsored by the Ford Family Foundation, who's helping us at the Institute for Youth Success at Education Northwest build a network of youth uh, development programs and practice. In these webinars, we try to highlight research, new policies, and innovative practitioners. Um, we have a few more coming up this spring, but if there's a topic that we haven't hit on that you'd love for us to, to share or to learn more about, we really welcome your feedback. Uh, you can offer that anytime in the chat panel or reach out to our staff. We'll provide our contact information at the end of the webinar. Some upcoming installments we have this year, we're going to hear from a uh, gentleman, Steve York, on integrating a youth perspective into policy next week. That's on Wednesday, April 27th. We'll also uh, have a researcher from the Search Institute join us to talk about developmental relationships. That's coming up on May 9th. And then uh, later in, in the month of May, we'll hear um, the second part of our uh, session on social emotional learning. And from a researcher here at Education Northwest, Shannon Davidson, uh, will talk about uh, perseverance, grit, and future orientation. Um, so thank you again for being on the call today. We're, we're really excited to dive into today's topic with you all. My name is Megan Perry, and I'm an advisor of youth programs here at Education Northwest, and I'll be the moderator for today's call. Just a, a few housekeeping things uh, to let you know how you can participate with us all in the webinar today. Everyone is muted for optimal sound quality, um, so we won't be able to hear your voice. But we really try to keep these uh, webinars as interactive and engaging as possible, uh, as you can do on the webinar format anyway. Um, so you can uh, raise your hand to ask a question. Um, you can also type anything into the question box or the chat box uh, anytime you like throughout the session. We'll pause at certain times uh, throughout the webinar to address some of those questions, or we might wait till the very end. We are scheduled to run till 11 a.m. this morning. Uh, we hope that you can stay on for the entire webinar. Julie has some wonderful resources that she's going to be sharing at the end. But we understand if you need to sign off early. And we will have this session uh, recorded so you can view it at a later time if you're interested. Uh, and there will be an evaluation that you'll receive at the end of this. So here is our overview for today's webinar. And we're going to give you an overview of what are youth and adult partnerships, and excuse the acronym, that's the shorthand for that. Um, and we're going to talk about youth and adult partnerships within your settings, within youth programs, and we'll take a look at some promising practices. Uh, I want to introduce you all to a few wonderful folks we have joining the call this morning. I'm joined first by my colleague here at Education Northwest, Julie Petrakuvi. Julie does uh, a whole bunch of wonderful work here at Education Northwest, including evaluation and training and technical assistance, primarily for a wide range of youth development and education initiatives. Julie has an interdisciplinary PhD in youth organization and community development from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where her studies really focused on today's topic of youth and adult partnerships. Uh, Julie leads a cross-state evaluation of our um, REL Northwest Research Alliances and conducts evaluation with several collective impact partnerships. So thank you for joining us today, Julie. I'm excited to be here. Well, before we uh, hear from Julie, I also want to introduce, introduce a couple other folks we're uh, really excited to have joining us today. We have, um, we're calling these our program panelists, or program representatives. We're uh, lucky to have Myra Perez, who's the Family and Youth Engagement um, coordinator uh, for the Conexiones program at Latino Network. This is an after-school leadership program for middle school youth. Myra is passionate about working with the Latino community, especially young people. Uh, her background might have something to do with that. She's the youngest of five kids. And um, Myra, you were born in, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, Michoacan, Mexico? Michoacan, yeah. <laughs> Uh, she grew up here in Salem, though, and considers herself an Oregonian, graduated from Western Oregon University with a BA in Communication Studies. So we've uh, just done some wonderful work here locally uh, with Latino Network and with Myra's support, so we're excited to hear her feedback on this topic today. We're also joined by Carolyn Mankey. Uh, Carolyn is the Vice President of Program Impact at Campfire Columbia. 
Carolyn Hales from New York, uh, but has been in the nonprofit sector here in Portland for over 10 years. And she's got a Bachelor of Science in Education from the University of Maine and a Master's in Sociology from Portland State University. Um, and Carolyn also has supported a lot of the local youth development uh, collective impact work and uh, things that we've done here in the Portland area. So we're excited to hear her perspective on the call today. Also from Campfire Columbia, uh, we have Ren Miles joining us, who's a doctoral candidate at PSU's School of Social Work. Uh, Ren is a research fellow at Campfire, where she's conducting her dissertation on uh, youth experiences of inclusion and participation and relationships in the middle and high school programming, as well as the organization's Youth Advisory Committee. You can see her, her research is very closely aligned to this topic of youth adult partnerships. Uh, Ren believes that uh, or her research is predicated on the idea that power, identity, and connection are really critical aspects of youth development and should be attuned to by adults uh, facilitating youth development programming. Um, and she believes that attending to these dynamics really helps develop or create um, successful youth-led partnerships and programming. So thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate having you on the webinar. And we'll uh, hear from each of you specifically in just a few minutes. Uh, here are the goals for today's session. Uh, we want to give you an overview of what we mean by this topic of youth adult partnerships and take a look at some of the research. We'll explore some promising practices and our, our program panelists will have some ideas to share with you all. Um, yeah, and we'll hear more about the experience of uh, youth and adult partnerships in their setting. So before we uh, pass it over to Julie and get started, I have a quick poll I'd like to launch um, just to give you a sense of how to interact with uh, the webinar format and to help us understand who's on the call this morning. So we first are curious to know what age group are you serving? So you can go ahead and respond to the poll. Your options are elementary, middle school, high school, young adult, or cross age. So it looks like um, we have a, a pretty good mix of folks on the call today. Um, not as many middle school uh, serving programs, which is interesting, um, but we have uh, programs that are serving youth across the board from elementary to young adults, and it looks like a number of you also serving youth in, in all those age ranges. So thank you for sharing. Um, and without further ado, I think I'll pass it on to Julie, um, who's going to tell us a little bit more about what we mean when we talk about this topic of youth and adult partnership. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today and talk about youth adult partnership. So to get us all on the same page, we're going to start first um, with the idea that there's what I would call a word soup right now. We all have different words that we use to describe this idea of engaging young people in making decisions about um, things that impact their lives, whether it's a program, or organization, or community. Um, and today we're re really going to focus on youth adult partnership or ideas related to engagement, empowerment, and in partnership on this list. And I like youth adult partnership because it's descriptive and we're talking about a group of youth and adults working together, so this isn't about a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but really about a group process where youth have the, um, that's based on the idea that young people have both the right and the capacity to participate in decisions that impact their lives. And it terms, it's a two-way relationship in that youth and adults are learning from each other as part of the process. And youth adult partnership is based on the idea that when we bring youth and adults together to make decisions, that we are going to strengthen our organizations and strengthen our communities while also promoting youth development. And this practice is taking a place across the country, I'd say um, increasingly in the last 10 years, but really for about the last 20 years in lots of different settings. Um, and just Today we're going to present a couple of frameworks and hear from some practitioners about the work that they're doing. But before I do that, I want to give you a little background on where this, these frameworks come from. My interest in youth adult partnership um, emerged when I started working in youth programs around 20 years ago, figuring out ways to engage young people, and these were elementary, middle, and high school age youth, 
in planning programs, in hiring staff, and making decisions around budgets and things like that. I was trying lots of different ways to do that, but there wasn't a ton of guidance out there. And so when I became a researcher, I had a chance to go out and study what people were doing. So this is research that's really based in practice. And so I studied a lot of different kinds of organizations that were engaging young people in partner, as partners and who were being really recognized as leaders in the field. And so I've done work with 4-H, looking at how 4-H is engaging young people as partners in their county boards and rural communities and in planning specific things like the fair and different committees. I also did some in-depth work with two youth organizing programs, um, one in Nashville and one in Austin, that were engaging young people as partners with adults in addressing um, real-world issues of educational equity and economic inequality. Um, I've also worked with community coalitions um, in New York and in Wisconsin looking to engage young people in making decisions around um, outreach and around public health and promoting youth development in communities, so a lot of things like safe and drug-free schools, um, engage young people in those coalition work. And then my dissertation work was with the Multnomah Youth Commission here in Portland looking at how young people are engaged in making decisions and advising on city, county policymakers and staff. And that just gives you a sense of the range of settings in which these adult partnerships are taking place. And here we've got a kind of a visual that captures that. And so one of the things that I want to start out by saying is that youth adult partnership is not a program model. It's actually a set of principles and practices that can be carried out by youth workers, but other adults and youth as well in a wide variety of settings. And so today we're going to really focus on your program and how your program targeting young people can be an entry point for young people to experience agency and empowerment and voice but in their program, but also in your organization and in your community. Um, and I think a lot of times when we talk about this, we talk about things like the Youth Commission or we talk about um, community organizing, which are really exciting um, models that are largely youth-driven, but they're pretty unique and not a lot of young people have access to them. And so I'm excited today because we're going to talk about places um, where young people already are, schools, after-school programs, summer programs, and how can we build youth adult partnerships into those settings. And I'm really excited to have um, the panel here with us today to talk about what they're doing in their community. Before I do that, I want to get a little more concrete about what is youth adult partnership and how does it relate to other types of youth development practice. So Zeldin and colleagues um, outlined four principles that distinguish YAP. Um, one of it is the idea that um, YAP is different than something like mentoring, that's a collective effort, like I mentioned earlier, and that there's a purpose to it beyond just youth development. That's a really lovely thing that happens as part of youth adult partnership, but youth are engaged in making decisions about not just their lives, but a larger community, whether it's their program, an organization, or their neighborhood. Um, and that, that when you get quality youth adult partnership, um, according to these authors, involves four key elements. The first is authentic decision making, and that means that youth and adults truly share control. So it's not just about adults inviting young people to give input on something that they may or may not listen to, but it's really about youth and adults making decisions together about things that are real and matter. It also involves natural mentors, and these are connect, it's in a way to connect young people with a wide range of adults in their program, in their community, who they might not get to interact with otherwise, and in a really different kind of relationship where they're working together around a common goal. It also involves reciprocity, um, where I was saying before it's a two-way relationship between youth and adults. Both sides benefit from this practice, and it involves mutual support and contribution, so everybody's contributing and everybody's benefiting from the practice. And the final principle is that of community connectedness. Youth adult partnership is a way for young people to experience a sense of belonging, to feel that what they're doing is relevant to a larger group, to feel included, and to have a role in how things work in their organization or community. So here in this slide is some of the research that supports youth adult partnership. There's been more and more research in lots of different settings to try to understand why is it about partnership, which is a really different way of working, um, between youth and adults, why is, does this matter? The first is that it's really in line with youth, um, positive youth development and it promotes overall development of adolescents. And we know adolescents are seeking autonomy in terms of independence to be able to make their own decision, but they also want to be able to be a member of a community. And so youth adult partnership is a way for young people to experience efficacy and mattering, but also feel a sense of purpose and a chance to contribute their skills and interests and voice in improving a community. 
There's also research that suggests that youth adult partnership promotes socio-emotional and civic development. So we know right now we're really interested in understanding how to promote engagement, how to help young people feel a sense of belonging, how to build um, really important life skills like strategic thinking and how to work in groups and be a leader. Um, youth adult partnership is a really great way for young people to practice and develop those skills. There's a really um, growing and large base of research that demonstrates, and we're talking about young people, especially those from historically marginalized groups, that youth adult partnership is a chance to experience agency, empowerment, and positive identity development. So for example, community-based organizations can provide an opportunity structure, which provides young people with access in terms of access for opportunities for voice and support for engaging, as well as critical social capital in terms of connection with peers and adults who can help them create positive change in their community. That's an example of how youth adult partnership is really important for identity development. And finally, from a really practical perspective, programs that provide opportunities for youth adult partnership see higher levels of retention and engagement. In most of our programs, youth don't have to be there. They choose to be there. And when young people have a chance to experience youth adult partnership, um, research is suggesting that they're more likely to show up and be engaged in the work that you're trying to do together. So in summary, youth adult partnership, by bringing together youth contributions and adult contributions through a process of mutual learning and collective action towards a broader goal, promotes thriving youth, but also thriving schools and communities. And there's a growing research, we're not going to dig into that today, that suggests that not just young people benefit, but organizations and adults. So, for example, the adults that I've um, interviewed talk a lot about how youth adult partnership makes them more interested in their work, more motivated to achieve a higher level of quality. They experience generativity in that they're passing on lessons they've learned, whether it's about um, community organizing or, or a specific subject. Organizations are more effective and more responsive because they're engaging youth in decision making in the design of their programs and the evaluation of their programs. And communities um, who often target young people with their policy are making a more just and more effective policy, more inclusive policy because they're engaging young people in the process. Thanks. Thanks for that uh, summary, Julie. Um, before we hear from our panelists, we, um, Julie's already talked a little bit about some of the benefits to um, building youth and adult partnerships in your setting. We'd like to open it up to you all um, using your chat panel. If you want to share, what do you see as some potential benefits to um, building youth and adult partnerships in your program? You can go ahead and, and take a couple minutes to take something in. I'll wait to see what are some of the ideas our audience shares. Someone asked if I could repeat the question. So we want to know what do you suppose are some of the benefits to building youth and adult partnerships in your setting for your program? While we wait for some responses to come in, uh, we can pass it over to Myra, um, who again is with Latino Network. And Myra, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, motivates Latino Network to engage in this work? Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Maida. Um, we at Latino Network provide culturally specific and culturally responsive programming. And a lot of the times, the youth that we work with um, find themselves being disengaged uh, and from the school that they attend, and even the community sometimes. And so part of what, mainly what we want to provide with our programming is a space where the student feels like they belong, um, and that we are providing the services um, that they need. And so one of the main things is, is giving the students voice, um, really challenging them and asking them what, what it is that they that they need and would like to see in our program. And one of the ways that um, we found is, you know, just really taking their, uh, their voice into consideration into what we do and what we offer and what are the topics that we bring into the program. And so um, one of the things also that we provide in our programming is uh, to engage them in their community and really connect them back with their school. And so, uh, in doing that, I think it's important for them 
to to learn how to do that. And so by allowing them to do that in our program, I feel like we're giving them the skills to then go into their school, go into the community with the confidence um, to engage and really participate in in their uh, in their community. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing, Maida. Um it looks like some audience members have shared that uh, some of the ways they think um, building youth and adult partnerships in uh, their settings will be beneficial is it helps make the program more effective. Julie shared some research on that. It also uh, allows the program to be at the right level and pace for participants. Um, so somebody was saying at the idea of the um, zone of proximal development that you're don't have too challenging or too easy a program, but it's right uh, in, the, in the need for youth. Um, and a couple people said that it helps with retention of youth, um, which is definitely a benefit. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, Maida, as you, you talked about um, uh, some of the ways that you engage uh, youth and adult partnerships in your setting and, and what motivates the Pino Network to do this work, where would you say that your organization at, is at in terms of your journey? Like, um, how, how long you've been doing this, how well you're doing this? Um, I would say we're, we're fairly new. Um, this is our first year really implementing um, something like this. And, um, you know, there's always some, some, you know, errors and, like, we change things. We think we have a plan, but then our youth come at us, you know, and, and that's part of it is um, being, being flexible with the youth, you know. Um, and so I would say... We're, we're still in the learning phase. Um, we've implemented a couple of programs this, this year, uh, but definitely ready to learn some more and uh, plan for next year. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm, I know our audience is excited to hear a little bit more about some of the strategies that Latino Network is using to engage in uh, youth and youth and adult partnerships. But before we hear some of those concrete strategies, I'd like to pass it over to um, Carolyn, who's going to talk a little bit about um, what motivates Camp Fire of Columbia um, to engage in this work. Camp Fire has been doing this work for a while, and we've um, tried many strategies over the years. And I think at the heart of uh, Camp Fire programming, we believe that if youth are very much engaged in building and participating in the program design and the content that they'll um, be more connected to the program and also more connected to um, the community, and they'll have stronger impacts and, and, and outcomes. We also believe that this youth adult partnership work can help young people become change agents for themselves, um, advocating for themselves, within, and also within their school and change agents within their community. Mm -hmm. So that's at the heart of our values and why we do this work. Wonderful. I think, um, thank you for sharing, both of you, I really appreciate that. And again, we'll um, hear some more concrete strategies from each of you in just a second. But uh, I think Julie's going to help us uh, dive into a little bit deeper into some of these benefits of engaging youth, uh, youth and adult partnerships in your program. I think everybody between the chat and what we've heard here has really touched on this. When we talk about what are the benefits of engaging young people as partners in everyday youth programs, all of the points you all mentioned in terms of promoting youth development, improving the quality of what you're offering in your program, having young people come to the program and stay engaged. Um, one of the things I heard was strengthening youth adult relationships and also connecting young people with a wider range of adults from the broader community and how that brings a level of excitement. Somebody put that in their comment, and I think that's a really good point that young people want to do things that are relevant. They want to be engaged in the real world, especially as they grow older in adolescence. And this is a really great way to provide young people with some support and scaffolding to do that. And again, the last point I would hit on is that this is important for the adults that are working with young people as well in terms of increasing their, it's a challenge and we have to support them, but it also increases their engagement and their job satisfaction. So lots of reasons to engage young people in programs. So what does that mean um, when we do that? And before we do that, I also just want to point out that this is becoming an increasingly common expectation and best practice for youth work. Some of you might be familiar, this is a pyramid of program quality from the Youth Program Quality Assessment that Weigert Center uses. And you'll see that engagement is at the highest level of the pyramid in that it's, it's one of the most impactful features of your program, but it's also one of the most challenging to reach. Um, other things like the um, after school program assessment tool also has engagement as a key feature of practice, as well as a, as well does a number of 
standards for youth workers. So this is a really actually not just a nice to do, but an expectation. So we know how important these opportunities are for youth development. And to Myra's point, especially for young people who aren't feeling experiencing inclusion or voice or engagement in school settings, your after school program, your summer program, your youth development program can be a really important place for young people to experience that in a positive way. So we think about how your program can be an opportunity for that. There's um, three ways that I think about it. One is program implementation, the second is program management, and the third is community leadership. And we're going to talk through some real world specific examples and opportunities for youth adult partnership at all of those levels of your program and organization and hear from each of these um, partners here about what it looks like for them. So let's start with program implementation. So program implementation is the core of what you do. This is about the youth adult interaction, the peer interaction that's taking place in your program no matter what the setting is like. This is where we have the most opportunities to reach the most youth. This is what I would call an everyday setting for youth adult partnership. How can we really think about all of these types of activities from organizing the space to planning activities, special events, even administrative things like um, recruiting um, participants and budgeting, how do we have to do that all ourselves as adults or could we find ways to engage young people? And I would say young people as, as early as elementary school, I've done some of these things with elementary school students in the work. How could we do that and how might that benefit our program while also benefiting young people? And so when we talk about program implementation, it's that everyday work um, that we do and it really requires us to shift how we think about our role um, and really try to break tasks down to engage young people in all these different places. And so I'd love to turn it over to Myra to talk a little bit about how you all are engaging young people in program implementation. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that we started doing this year, in, uh, and I, I forgot to mention, I work specifically with middle school students, um, and one of the things that uh, we started doing is we started uh, co-leading um, or co-facilitating the sessions with the youth. So it started with, I had one youth that asked me like, hey, can I do an activity? And I said, sure. Um, he was so excited and uh, it turns out youth listen more to the youth <laughs> than they do to me. So um, that gave me an idea and, and I started to continue to do it. You know, I would invite students um, and ask them like, who would like to, you know, co-lead with me? and. They were so excited about it, and some of them were so nervous, uh, but at the end they felt so proud because they had an opportunity to, to be kind of like on the teacher role and, and share that experience with me. And so I've continued to do it. It definitely takes a little bit more of um, preparation with the youth, but uh, it's part of uh, being there as a support um, and having them learn from it, you know, um, so that's something that has really worked very well with us. Thanks so much, Myra. Do folks from Campfire have anything to add? I'll have one um, comment looking at the, the list up here on the screen. One thing that we've done in Campfire, um, we do establish group norms with every new incoming group of, of young people. And over the years, we've moved away from um, mirroring the school's discipline model to a certain extent. So while there are school rules that we do follow, we have moved toward um, managing conflict in a slightly different way using um, circling. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten some restorative justice training from um, Resolutions Northwest, which is a great organization that's helped us, helped our staff learn how to circle youth up and how to manage conflict within that group in a very different way. So that's one thing that's been very successful. That's great. And one thing I would add is, and it's probably really intimidating. Oh, it's not on this one. Actually, I'm going to stop. I'm going to bring that up later. Sorry. Um, but I do want to say um, my colleague Tom Akiva at, at Pitt has been talking, we've been talking about the potential for youth adult partnership to engage young people in this work and how it's been happening for many years in programs that work across ages, such as the Boys and Girls Club, such as Campfire, where you're working with young people elementary through high school in that counselor and training programs. And a lot of those programs already hire staff who come up, who are youth who came up in the program once they get into high school. They're often employed in the program. So if you're in one of those programs, you're already ha having a, a tradition around this. How could you start to work with younger youth and give them opportunities to prepare for high school level leadership? And there's some really nice models. And those programs actually depend on young people to drive the implementation of the program. All right, so thank you all for sharing um, how you're engaging young people in implementation. Now let's talk about program management. And I think for a long time in the research and practice on youth adult partnership, this is where everybody was. 
Um, we've talked about youth on boards. Have folks heard that before? There's an organization that does really good work called Youth on Boards. There's a lot of ways that organizations are engaging youth on boards, and that's just one way to engage young people in program management. And for some young people, that works really well. But there's a whole host of other ways you can engage young people in program management and not necessarily integrate them on the adult board. And I think that's really important as you think about how to make these adult partnerships something that appeals to a wide range of youth. So for example, in my work, I've engaged young people in hiring staff. And that is a little intimidating, and you do need to work with your HR um, staff person on that, but it is very possible. And I think a lot of programs struggle with retention of staff as well as retention of youth, and I found it really effective if you had a phase in the hiring process where young people were involved to really make sure the youth workers you were hiring were a good match for the youth that they're gonna be working with. And a lot of times, it, um, also, the youth workers who were interviewed said this was the hardest interview they ever had because you can talk abstractly about youth, but when they're in the room, you really need to talk about how you're going to build relationships in an authentic way. So that's an example how we might think beyond boards of how to engage young people in program management. A thing I want to point out about this is when you're taking youth adult partnership out of the program setting into your other organizational settings, you're going to create really cool opportunities for youth to interact with adults who aren't youth workers, right? You might have your human resource per person, your budget person, your evaluator. And I just want to point that out. That's a really great opportunity. But you also want to prepare those adults for that interaction. And we also want to talk about training for adults and capacity building for adults, whether they're board members or um, staff of the organization. So they can really, both the youth and adults can be set up for success in partnering around program management issues. So I think Campfire is going to kick us off with some conversation about how you all are engaging young people in program management. Thank you. Campfire has had a history of having youth on their board of directors. We currently have um, seats on our board reserved for youth, but we have been in a process of, of transition and rethinking the role of youth on a board of directors. And this is something that's been uh, a part of Campfire for over at least a couple of decades. It's been a, a very long tradition. However, currently we have a youth advisory committee and that's uh, designed to encompass our, uh, all of our adolescent programs. So we have youth on that committee from our summer camp. We have youth on that committee from our high school program and youth on that committee from our middle school program. And that committee as its own entity um, is able to give feedback to our whole organization, everything from our development uh, department to our evaluation department, um, and particularly to programming. And we do bring in um, folks from the office to learn from the advisory committee and the advisory committee to learn from the adults about their role and how Campfire runs as an organization. And where we are today with revisiting um, do we want to have youth on our board or do we want to keep this um, committee separate? I, our vision is to have that youth interact with the board in some constructive way. And even though we've been involved in doing this work for decades, we are still really, really learning. And we haven't found the secret sauce. And we have found some great organizations like Momentum Alliance that has really helped us understand what it takes to successfully have a youth on a board and give us some ideas about um, what our future could look like. So we're still planning, mm -hmm. and the youth are not on the board currently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really important to model that um, youth adult partnership is a learning process for individuals as well as organizations, and it's really important to always be striving for continuous improvement like we are in any aspect of our program and really thinking about how to shift the culture of the organization and adults' frames to figure out different ways to engage youth. So thank you for sharing that. Campfire is also engaging young people in evaluation work. Ben, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, when I first met with folks at Campfire, they expressed an interest in starting a youth participatory evaluation project. Um, and that was when I first came on as a doctoral research fellow um, last year. And so at the time, I was aware of Campfire's robust evaluation department, which included traditional survey instruments. So my work so far has included researching youth participatory evaluation methods and really creating a plan for implementation. So I created a set of questions for Campfire to reflect on as an organization. And the first of these was to define the purpose of this type of evaluation and also to um, come to uh, 
and to create a definition for youth participation or youth voice, what Julie referred to earlier as word soup. There's a lot of um, kind of using these terms interchangeably, and so really thinking as an organization, how, how can we define that? How do we want to define that right now? Um, so with that, there are a range of ways for youth to participate and a range of purposes for evaluation. So for this first step, I wanted Campfire to reflect on the organization's principles and values and then think about how this project would fit into that vision. Um, and the degree to which youth participate may look different for different organizations or, or even over the course of implementing such a methodology. So, and additionally, evaluation can ask questions internal to the organization's programs or on the other end of the continuum. Um, the evaluation or research questions can be based in the community and intended to create social change. Um, so I think it's important to define these parameters before jumping in the deep end. So my plan for preparation and implementation includes thinking through multiple aspects of that implementation and creating a space for reflection and discussion regarding the hopes and concerns for such a project. So for example, an aspect of organizational preparation would be to discuss what the potential barriers are and concerns of all staff involved. So I've also recommended that Campfire integrate this project into their program logic models, theory of change, and established policies, all in an effort to create a solid structure for youth and adults engaging in this type of evaluation project. So the idea here is that the organization will be solidly prepared to invite youth to participate and that the process can continue as opposed to a one-off program. So this, this would also necessitate FTE support and supply or incentive needs for youth and training is a, also a part of the groundwork for this process. Um, and lastly, the plan continues through the first pilot project, which again depends on how those initial questions of evaluation purpose and type of participation are answered. So for example, there's something called transformative evaluation, which aligns with social justice principles and starts with a question driven by youth interests or concerns. And this type of evaluation includes preparation and education with youth regarding systemic oppression and advocating for change. Um, on the other end of that continuum, youth may have questions internal to the program. Um, and so a project like this can start there and then, then eventually move to the more social justice based questions in the community. Thank you so much, um, Ren and Carolyn, for sharing these examples of innovative ways to engage young people through your program and program management. And as you can imagine, young people get exposed to the kind of behind the scenes work of this organization they might have been involved in for multiple years, which is really cool, but also some different career options. And it gives them a chance to try out different aspects, different things that you don't really get a chance to do in school. And so I really appreciate you guys taking that time to share that. And now we're going to talk about the final way um, that we might think about engaging youth um, as partners in your program, as an access point to engaging youth as community leaders. And I think Ren started to address that when she talked a little bit about transformative evaluation and how questions might be about the program itself or about the larger community. And so here you've got in the middle a um, youth adult partnership in your program where kids are, young people are developing really deep relationships with adults to have a stable um, home base of support. Um, but it also can be a place where you're helping young people connect with the broader community because we know that's a really important part of youth development. And so around the outer edge of the circle, you see the different ways that programs are often doing it. So for example, um, we heard a little bit about service learning and we're going to hear some more about that today. Youth-driven philanthropy is a key thing. Um, youth need, youth produced media is a really important opportunity for young people to express how they're feeling about issues um, to a broader audience beyond the program itself. Action research, I think, is growing and growing in, in um, interest, where um, young people are starting to really go in depth about a problem that they're experiencing in their school, in their community, something that's going on that they want to try to really understand the root cause of and make recommendations or even take action on for change. And so I think action research is a really growing area that youth programs are figuring out ways that they can connect young people, um, help them channel their energy and ideas into community improvement. 
And sometimes youth partnership is a way to connect um, young people with things like a youth commission or a broader citywide, um, countywide youth advisory council. That can be a way for young people to have the support of a youth program but still participate in these citywide bodies. And then organizing and activism. A lot of those programs um, grow from after school programs and things like that. And so there's lots of ways. So you can think about your program, um, youth adult partnership, not just being about your own setting, but really helping youth, especially older youth, tap into broader community resources. And so we're going to hear a little bit, I think, starting with Myra, for how Latino Network is providing a home base for young people to have voice in the broader community. Yeah. Um, so our program throughout the year, we've been working with our youth um, in uh, service learning focus. And so uh, we've been uh, working with them to really dive into their community mm -hmm. and um, look at, you know, what are the assets in their community? Uh, what, what's the need in their community? And so um, we have been working with our youth for them to uh, develop a service learning project that will be meaningful within the community. And so it's definitely breaking it down for them uh, and having it fully be their ideas and, and their project um, and having me just be a support for them in the process. Uh, so some of the things that we've done with the youth to really dive into this community, we've done um, community mapping um, and other activities for them to to understand their community and, and what it is that they're passionate about and have, allow them to uh, become change agents. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is developing uh, their terminology, you know, uh, working along with that. Uh, so right now we're working with them in developing and implementing their service projects. Uh, and we focus primarily on uh, our youth advisory board members, which are youth. Um, we have six to eight youth in the board, uh, and they are the students that come with, uh, take the ideas from the group, uh, think about it, come up with one to two or three uh, examples or plans, and then they take it back to the group so that it is a little bit more manageable and we don't have 25 students, you know, coming up with ideas and brainstorming. Um, so it's a little bit more manageable for the six to eight youth advisory students to, to really plan um, and lead the, the program or the service project. Sarah, right, can you give us an example of a service project um, or an issue that your group is tackling? Yeah. So some of the students, uh, they came up with, you know, racism within the community, stereotyping. And so we, we worked uh, to see what service project they could do that would be meaningful. That's not just, you know, posting posters or... Uh, something that would have a lasting impact. So they decided to focus on profiling, um, and apparently there's an in-profiling campaign here in, in Portland, and so they've uh, partnered up with that, and they um, are learning about it now. What are the skills um, that are needed to stop and the profiling? Uh, so what they're going to be doing is they're going to be doing presentations to their youth, to their uh, peers, uh, so that other students can also be uh, prepared and, and have knowledge on how to deal with this situation. Um, and they'll also be doing uh, workshops for their parents um, to really it, uh, spread the word. People don't know that the, um, you know, what profiling is. And so starting there um, is, is, you know, is what they're doing right now. And when they came up with the topic, we thought, is this, too dense for them, but no, you know, we, we broke it down and they really take an ownership of it. Um, so, you know, it all depends on how, how you break it down and really breaking it down for them. Yeah, that's a really key thing, breaking things down, taking things and making it accessible. And you're working with middle school students, right? Yeah. And so make, having them find their personal connection and help them build the skills to engage. And I really like this example because you're connecting, you're using your program as a way to connect with a broader initiative that's taking place in the city. Um, and I think it's also a really good example, and I heard this for sure in these organizing programs I worked with um, in a similar way that, like financial literacy, for example, a group I was working, young people were working on payday lending, and this was, you know, 10 years ago. They were doing education with their family members around payday lending and about what that means and how to address kind of, they're working on policy issues, but also doing outreach to adults. And so there's broader effects of engaging young people in these real-world issues. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Um, folks from Hanfire, would you add anything briefly about how your organization is engaging young people and connecting them with the larger community? 
Yeah, I would say it's, it sounds very similar to what Myra had mentioned. Um, our youth do a, a needs assessment, which is a little informal, interviewing community members, school members, some community data. They do also surface their own topic, and we, the adult and the youth work together to manage this project over multiple months. So it is broken down into how do you set goals, appointments, who do you reach out to in the community, find resources. And one example of one of the projects we did, um, which we thought, wow, this is, this is going to be heavy for middle school youth. Um, the topic that they surfaced was police community relations. And so we reached out to an organization, Cop Watch, who said that they have, have never worked with youth as young as middle school before, but we asked them to come anyway and work with our youth to teach them about their rights. And it was really successful once we worked with them to break it down into smaller parts like you mentioned, and we had a lot of success, and they too went back and were able to talk to their families about what their rights were and, and left with, with information. So I just add that it sounds so similar to, <laughs> to what you're doing, which is, which is fabulous. Oh, and a lot of potential there, right? So connecting programs as well as connecting programs with resources like Hopwatch and the broader community. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for helping to make that real. We're going to transition into, wow, these ideas are really exciting and they sound awesome. How do we do that in my organization? What does it look like? Um, and I think the main challenge with youth adult partnership is moving from this idea of youth voice to youth impact. And that we don't want to just give young people a chance to give input or be on stage and, you know, all of that. We really want to have young people engaged in meaningful work that matters to them but also their families as these examples were given to us today. And so there's a couple of things that I've learned from my work with programs around the um, nation that I think are important to keep in mind in terms of how to help your program and organization move from youth voice to impact. First is really remembering that youth adult partnership is countercultural. This is not how we typically have youth adult relationships in schools and families and lots of things in society. So we really need to take the time for adult learning as well as youth learning about this new type of relationship. And it's going to require us to shift some of our organizational norms, things that we think are only adult responsibilities. Could they also be youth responsibilities, for example? Could we switch what time of the day we have meetings so young people can be there? There's a lot of different things we can talk about, or even with things like on boards. How do we change our board policy to allow young people to be in that decision-making role? Um, related to that, a lot of the youth adult partnership um, groups that I study talked about how this requires them to shift how we do business, and that's when we start to get into those management pieces that we talked about. And finally, we find that organizations that are doing the most innovative and impactful work have an organizational culture of youth adult partnership that they've built over time. And that doesn't mean these are organizations led by youth. These are organizations led by youth and adults have been really intentional about how they support and engage young people as partners. I want to share this figure. This is not from my research. This is from Wong, Zimmerman, and Parker. But I really like this figure about youth adult partnership um, is being about kind of sharing control. And so they, this is a pyramid around um, youth empowerment. And what they conceptualize is that the highest degree of opportunities for youth empowerment are really at the peak of the pyramid, where young people and adults are sharing power and control. And so I put that little star, youth adult partnership, next to it, because I think that's what we're seeking here. And again, why we're talking about not just youth voice, but youth adult partnership. And there's a couple of things I want to point out about it. You know, when I interview young people about effective youth adult partnership, what they talk about is adults know how to, when to step up and when to step back. And I think a lot of times when we talk about youth adult partnership or youth voice, adults think, well, I need to step completely out of the room. I just need to get out of young people's way, let them do their thing. And I think that's not owning the power and resources and um, good things adults can contribute to these relationships. And so a lot of times when adults completely step out of the picture, young people don't have the support they need or the authority they need to really realize their goals. And so I think it's really important that we keep in mind this in the partnership, even though we need to think about how to interact with young people in a different way. And so adults know when to step up and when to step back by having good relationships with young people, being able to read the signals of um, kind of when they need support and when they're able to kind of fly on their own. Lots of practice beforehand, lots of scaffolding. Um, and with a lot of the groups I've worked with, they call it um, pre-briefs and debriefs, especially if you're doing something like a public presentation or policy advocacy or even going to a board meeting. So how do we pre-brief and prepare you for that interaction kind of have you have that interaction and let's debrief what happens. We can make meaning of it and I can provide some context as an adult who maybe has some more experience in the setting. 
And so those are some things to keep in mind. Um, and we think about how to share power with young people. Uh, there's a couple of things. You often might see a ladder as an example of youth voice or youth adult partnership. The problem with that, in my mind, is that it positions youth-led programs as the, the ideal. And I think there's not very many youth-led programs out there. They're awesome, and they, they have a particular role to play. But we're talking about everyday settings where most youth are. We're really, really working towards that shared control model. And I, the final thing I'll say about this is that not every decision in your organization is going to be a youth adult partnership. There are some things that adults will decide. There are some things that youth will decide. You really want to be thoughtful about where do we have the opportunity to do this, where do we have the capacity to do this, and how can we do that well. So just some things I wanted to share about that. Great. Thank you, Julie. This is a really uh, helpful visual, I think, to um, help programs think about where they're currently at in engaging youth adult partnerships in their setting and where they want to go. And to that end, uh, we have a, a poll question, that, uh, another poll we'd like to launch now. Um, and this is a, a three-part poll. So we want to get a sense of to what degree do youth adults share control for key decisions in all three of these areas that we've talked about today. So you're going to go through, make sure that um, you respond to each section, um, to what degree they share control on program and implementation, management, and leadership. And then uh, hit the Submit button at the bottom of the poll. And you're finished. We'll give folks just another minute to think about this. So it looks like, just reading the poll as it comes in, it looks like um, program implementation is where we see the most, um, in your program, shared opportunities for shared control. So that's really exciting, ways to engage young people in program implementation. And then it looks like program management, largely led by adults, not unusual in what we, we often see. And so a key opportunity to kind of take youth adult partnership to another level on the pyramid in your program. And with community decision making, it looks like it's interesting that young people have a little more opportunity for shared control and community, um, more so than program management. So what are some lessons learned, some practices from that setting that you can maybe bring into program management or other places in your organization to find more opportunities for youth and adults to share control? And just to give you a chance to unpack that a little bit more, um, this next uh, prompt we're asking you to reflect using the chat box. If you just want to think about, take a minute to reflect on in one of those specific areas, um, you can choose program implementation or program management or community leadership. If you want to move further up that pyramid to strengthen youth adult partnerships in that specific area, what would you need as a program to do that? Um, so if you want to use your chat box to just share with us in the audience uh, what you would need to, to strengthen youth and adult partnerships in your setting in that one particularly focused area. Take a minute to see what some folks share. Somebody asked, is this for where our programs are at currently? Yeah, if you think about where you're at right now and what you would need to move um, further up that pyramid to strengthen these middle partnerships. Yeah, so somebody said, a space to meet with youth and time. Sounds like engaging youth is uh, a challenge that some people are facing. How to get some feedback from young people. If, even if you open it up to them, um, how to engage them to actually get. Especially younger youth, it's different, right? You have to figure out ways that are developmentally appropriate. And so how do you further break things down? 
um, maybe a little less open-ended, more choices in the beginning with elementary school age youth? Great questions. Somebody, I think, is getting to the idea of staff retention and um, trying to the need to build really strong relationships between young people and staff is a key piece to promoting this. Absolutely. A few more comments about time, making sure that um, there's enough time and um, kind of ongoing interactions between youth and adults to, to strengthen youth and adult partnerships within particular programming. And clear, clear and better parameters. So understanding what we mean, we talk about youth participation, youth adult partnership. What do we want our program to get out of it and what do they want to get out of it? I really appreciate that, that point. And I'm going to touch upon a little bit of those as I share some of the, some of the best practices we've heard about from research. Um, so the first, the one on the green bar and the green box on the left are practices that I think help, um, they're supportive for youth adult relationships. We're talking about youth adult partnership on the right are some practices that are more about the larger organization. And these are based on research with organizations that have really built a culture of youth adult partnerships. So the first is young people, just like us, not all of us are going to want to sit on a board or work on a budget. We want choices about how we participate. And so really offering multiple options for participation at different ages, different types of activities. And um, really embracing alternative forms of expression. So when young people are coming to board meetings, they shouldn't be board meetings as usual. They should really have alternate ways for young people to engage that are more interactive, that are maybe more small group time, um, et cetera. And what I've heard from folks is that when you do that in groups like board meetings, it becomes more engaging for everybody. But it does require us to shift how we do um, business. The second is to provide scaffolding for youth leadership and responsibility. So making sure young people have a chance to practice and practice and practice those skills as well as the confidence they need to give voice, to engage with adults inside the program, outside the program, and increasing levels of responsibility. Scaffolding isn't just about opportunity, but it's also about providing them with support as they move up into greater levels of responsibility and leadership. And the final thing I want to address is issues of power, really being explicit about issues of power and creating safe space for respectful dialogue. And I would say it's important to attend to not just between youth and adults, but really among youth themselves. And when we're talking about group decision making, group process, um, really getting real feedback from young people, we need to be explicit about how we address issues of power and privilege. On the right-hand side, um, the first thing I want to mention is the importance of organizations cultivating coaches and champions for YAP. Um, these adult partnership coaches are experienced practitioners who really get the practice and who can help other practitioners or even people like the executive director or a board member improve their practice because they can model it and coach them. Champions are those people like the executive director or the finance director or the HR director who can change policy and be a leader who really says, our organization is going to commit to youth adult partnership. We're going to provide resources to make it possible. We're really going to be a leader in this way. And I find that organizations need a mix of coaches and champions. And from that flows policies and procedures that support YAP. So, for example, you need um, to allow young people to give input on programming, you need the flexibility to not have your curriculum plan too far in advance because you want to give youth input. Um, there's an example of how you might need to shift a policy or procedure to allow for youth adult partnership or your board requirements, things like that. Um, I think some folks were mentioning this earlier, the importance of having and documenting clear roles for youth and adults. Sometimes a position description is important, sometimes compensation is important to really recognize the valuable contributions young people are making and to clarify what their role is and what the expectations are. Because remember, this is their first time participating in these types of settings. We can't assume they know what it means to be a board member or participate in an evaluation. We want to be really explicit about that. Um, and then finally, time and resources for collective learning, as everybody's been talking about today, that's really um, important to have. Before we finish up, are there any last, I'd say, one piece of advice that our panelists would like to offer to folks before we uh, move on to resources? I would say for us, it was really intimidating when we wanted to, you know, um, begin implementing the detour programs. And I would say be okay with, with things not working out, changing things, um, adapting things to the youth that you serve. Um, I think that's really important to know that just because a plan that you had or, or how you wanted to implement something didn't work out, it's, it's 
you know, it's adapting it and changing it and moving forward. Uh, you know, there's always going to be mistakes, <laughs> and I think that's something that we really had to, like, move forward with because there was a lot of things that we implemented and that our youth were just not into it. We weren't getting engagement, and so it was about changing it and, and making it work for the youth. Absolutely, being responsive. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And I would also recommend reaching out to others who are doing the work and collaborating. We've learned a lot from other organizations. Some organizations starting out have learned from us in terms of things we've tried that didn't work. So I would suggest getting out in the community and reaching out to other people who are doing what you're interested in doing and learning from them. I would say um, coming from a stance of reflection and allowing space for that on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis, and I think that goes a bit with what you're saying, that um, matter of that mistakes are going to happen, you know, and I think it, you know, we can get caught up in just doing business and moving along and being able to step back and say, you know, reflect about it, um, adults and youth. Yes. Um, and whether that's about identity, power, privilege, whether it's about some logistics with the project. But. Reflecting together and also sometimes in age different spaces. Sometimes adults need a place to talk with other adults about their practice and sometimes youth need a youth dominated space to talk about their experiences. So these are really wonderful points. Before we finish, I just want to direct you all to there's some links here to resources to help you. Yap Savvy is a workbook that's useful for thinking about some questions you might raise with your colleagues about how do we become an organization that's focused on youth adult partnership. Um, the other pieces are also resource guides and some research that would give you a little more ideas about what might outcomes and goals look like for the adult partnership, what are we working towards, how can we incorporate that in our organization. Um, the final one there is a new rubric that's out uh, from some colleagues that really tries to take some of these theories and apply it into a tool that programs could use to assess the quality of these adult partnership. And so this is a real emergent area of work. Lots of new resources are coming out every day. Here's just a few that we can offer. And I also want to say that we're hoping to do a longer, more intensive um, workshop on this in person at some point so we can really get to a deeper level of practice and help folks um, learn from each other. So stay tuned um, for that opportunity through IYS. Thank you all for your time today. Yeah, thank you, everybody. We're out of time, but uh, we will stay on the call um, to uh, answer any questions that um, you might have for our panelists or our uh, expert researcher, um, Julie, on the line. Um, so you can uh, hop off if you, if you uh, don't have any questions, and thank you so much for joining us. Otherwise, you can stick around, and we'll um, try to address some of those questions in the next couple of minutes. And just a, another reminder, um, you can get more information about um, upcoming webinars uh, and uh, follow up with our team if you have other questions or are looking for training or resources. Uh, you can visit educationnorthwest.org um, and IYS or the Institute for Youth Success is the, the program that um, is sponsoring this holiday. So I see a question here. Can you give examples of creating multiple options for youth to participate? Does anybody else want to address that? Um, multiple options. Um, this is Camp Carolyn from Campfire. We have multiple options within our organization, if that's mm -hmm. what you're, yeah. you're thinking of. So we have um, ways for youth to participate on the Youth Advisory Committee, but then we have um, other roles such as internships. We have opportunities for youth to um, give feedback and have um, leadership roles just within their program. I don't know if that mm -hmm. hits on what you're asking. It absolutely does, yeah. So not every youth is going to be able to take the time to sit on an advisory board. So how do you have those opportunities in the program? Or, for example, some youth might want to express themselves through media. So how could you have some opportunities that are maybe focused on governance, some opportunities that are focused on media, maybe some are focused on outreach, that's something that a lot of young people are really interested in. So diversifying the different ways that young people have voice and leadership in your program. So another question here is, one way we have youth is meeting with the group. How do I get those who are introverted more involved? So surveys was one option that was put out there. I'd love to hear what folks are doing to engage those youth. Um, yeah. So hi, this is Maida. Um, I work with middle school students, and it's really hard to get them to speak and, and just share their ideas. One of the things that has worked for us is um, really giving them different options, you know, whether it's 
working in partners, working in small groups, and then um, sharing out to the bigger group, uh, giving them different opportunities like that. Or sometimes I have them um, do journaling, and then I, you know, take those ideas and share them with the group. Um, this, well, yeah, youth have different ways that they share, and so just adapting to that, you know, whether it's in writing, in small groups, um, presentations, drawings, um, just being creative. Thank you. Those are some really um, important uh, examples of different ways to engage youth and get feedback um, in a setting that involves youth. We you know, I mean, I think we can all reflect back to um, awkwardness of middle school days and some of um, some different stages of youth development, and it can be pretty vulnerable to share ideas um, with your peers or with other adults in the room. So thinking about different ways you can group young people to um, make that, that vulnerability a piece a little bit more comfortable than maybe sharing a partner like Myra said uh, first or in a journal to get at some of that information. Those are some really neat examples. Um, but somebody also mentioned uh, they're wanting to access some of the resources that Julie mentioned here. And of course, um, we will share uh, a copy of this presentation. There's access to a recording and both um, a hard copy of the slides, so you'll be able to click on those hyperlinks and follow some of those resources. Another question is about any resources for addressing issues of power? Does anybody have anything they'd like to use? For addressing issues of power. Mm -hmm. I I can't think of a particular resource off the top of my head, but um, something I do with my classes, and this also goes back to um, different ways of engaging youth, um, allowing those space, spaces for reflection, starting with relationship building. Um, there's different activities like, um, what is it, has anyone heard of the privilege walk or mm -hmm. the, when you think about different aspects of privilege? Um, independently, there's activities like that mm -hmm. um, to kind of start with. Um, yeah, I generally start with basic um, introduction to concepts around what is oppression and privilege and how can we reflect on that independently. And I think what's important in that as a, an adult facilitating that is to participate and to be very mm -hmm. transparent about your identities um, and to kind of model that. Yeah, and, and the, work, the groups that I've worked with have to develop their own models based on lots of different other types of resources, exactly like what you're talking about, and engage young people in facilitating those mm -hmm. conversations too, so it's not just the adults facilitating the conversation, but young people are also facilitating conversations around identity, power, and privilege, and really, for many young people, it's the first chance they've had to critically reflect mm -hmm. about that. Um, I can think about my, my work with the Youth Commission. This is really important in groups that are multi-age, and where the youth come from a wide range of backgrounds, you really want to attend to that right away because issues of power are going to start coming up mm -hmm. immediately in terms of who talks, how much they talk, who doesn't talk. And I think as an adult, coaching other young people as facilitating the group is being, kind of figuring out ways to address that. Like how can you help to make sure that everybody has a chance to engage, that everybody is talking, that the conversation isn't dominated by one person. And do those activities to help young people really start to see that in their interactions and start to support each other in addressing that. So we can think about, there's some more websites and resources that maybe we can send out to the group afterwards that might help you think about what you could adapt for your program. Okay, well, um, I don't see any other questions, so I think we're gonna go ahead and um, wrap up here today. Thank you so much for your participation and a big thank you to our panelists today. We really appreciate um, being having your input and your voice on the call today um, and your examples um, for these other program practitioners from across the country. So thank you all. And you're welcome to reach out to us here at Education Northwest, to Megan or myself, if you have any follow-up questions or are interested in more training on this topic, we'd be happy to talk with you. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you.